Hey, what's going on folks, it's Mike here, and today I'm sharing with you a very special conversation I had with Bill, also known as Ginger Bill, who's best known these days as the creator of the Odin programming language. Now in this conversation, we're gonna talk about various programming proverbs, advice, wisdom, his journey from a youngster all the way to where he is now as a programmer, and even some of the cool software that's been developed in the Odin programming language. So with that said, go ahead, sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation with Bill, the creator of the Odin programming language. Well, thanks, Bill, for joining today. It is the evening for you, the afternoon for me, and again, I appreciate your time. And I'd like maybe for you to just give a you know brief description of who you are, what you're working on, and then we're going to actually jump into the past a little bit, and then we'll get into Odin, which I think a lot of folks know you for. But uh, why don't you go ahead and just briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you very much for letting me come on anyway, Mike. Uh, my name is, well, Bill or Ginger Bill. And I am the creator of the Odin programming language. Um, I also work at Jenga FX on Embergen, Liquigen, and Geogen, which are all real-time products in their domain. So Embergen is a real-time makes fire, smoke, and explosions. Liquigen is for liquids, and Geogen is for like landscapes and anything like geology-based in that regard. So that's kind of what I am doing at the moment. So in that way, you could say I'm just a software engineer of some sorts. Very cool. Software engineer extraordinaire, as we're going to find out, I think, here. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, as you mentioned here, one of the first, um, you know, Jenga FX, that's where I first sort of heard about Odin and the language. Yeah. It was while I was at the Handmade Seattle, um, which I believe you've maybe attended in the past or have been part of that. Yeah. Year. Okay. Yeah, I was on it. Uh, I was I was actually hosting last year, and I was also at the very first Handmade Seattle back in 2019 as well. Very cool. So, yeah. Very cool. Great, great community of folks. Uh, yes. Great to see, you know, the Jenga FX uh, folks, yourself included there. Yeah. Presented some really, really cool demos. So uh, we can link to those uh, in the show notes, I suppose, here, just to see, you know, one of the, uh, I would say, you know, most impressive, uh, again, maybe we'll get into this later, but uh, demos I've seen that pretty much every game studio and movie studio is using, which yeah. is super cool. Um, so a real testament to to Odin as well as you know just uh, the software engineer development that you folks are doing. Mm. Um, well, thank so, you. so you know that's kind of taking us to where you are now. But I always like to rewind mm. a little bit with my guests and figure out where you started, how you got into programming. Yeah. Um, so you know a question I ask folks is, what's the first program you remember writing? Do you have any memory of that? Well, it depends on what you mean by a program, is half the answer. Uh, but the very first thing I probably ever used was like Batch. And this was because it, when I was at primary school, I was effectively this school technician, mm -hmm. which is probably highly illegal, but I, I didn't care. It got me out of class <laughs> to fix like printers or uh, fax machines or, or computers or stuff like that. And I remember trying to learn how to automate something, mm -hmm. learning how to do that. And I had to learn something like Batch on, on like Windows 98, I think it was at the time. And, uh, and yeah, it's fine. But my actual first program, I think what I was trying to do was I was trying to make a game. I wanted to learn how to make games. So my actual first, let's say, programming language, which I know Bash is technically one, but it would have been Game Maker. Hmm. So I was learning Game Maker. And, and that language is um, something. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, and that, but then after that, I was kind of learning other languages. So like I learned pa C and Pascal. I think I learned Pascal off an old book my dad had for some reason. I have no idea why. He's not a programmer. Hmm. Um, but he had the book and I just remember learning stuff like that. And it was always kind of a, that was kind of my progression. So I was always kind of like wanting to learn how to do things like that, especially while I was enjoying like maybe games or uh, just learning how computers work kind of thing. That was always kind of how I was as a kid. So were you, would you say you were a tinker then? I mean, all the way back to primary school doing batch scripting. Was that something you yeah. like, saw your dad do or were just no, fascinated by? No, no. Well, my dad always had computers, so we were... My very first computer I ever used was an Acorn Archimedes. Mm. So most people may not know even know what that is, but in the UK we had Acorn computers, and uh, they were very popular. Now most people know what Acorn is nowadays. Mm. If I said Acorn Risk Machines, also known as ARM, mm. it, you all know what that means nowadays because that's what they were developing. That's what they made the chips for their computers, do less lot. But the computer side of the industry. They went bankrupt um, in like the early 2000s, probably like around about 2000. Um, they were trying to, uh, from what I remember, they were trying to get into broadband way too early. Mm. Um, and clearly, I remember at the time, I remember not even touching broadband until like 2006, 2007 time. Mm. Like that's, 
which I'm not even that old, but I do remember when we got it because I remember dial up and you have to wake up and we had my dad had a separate phone line just for the flipping internet, which is quite funny. But no, I mean, I've not been a tinkerer. Actually, my professional background, I don't know, I just always interested in learning things, many things. My actual professional background is physics. Hmm. I trained, got a master's degree in like quantum mechanics and such like that. I even went to go do a PhD until I quit that. So that was going to be in condensed matter physics. So clearly, I am not wasn't originally going to go into the programming path per se, but then I kind of accidentally fell into it in many ways, like most of my life. Wow. So so during that physics degree or during your yeah. undergrad, were you, I mean, were they teaching you programming? I mean, you already had some programming experience. I was still programming. Program, so. um, the short answer is I think we had a very short course on learning out of MATLAB, but it was very much a, I turned up, kind of learned the, learned the syntax myself and I was like, okay, I'm done. And that was great, but they were, that was the only formal teaching I ever had in the programming language. Hmm since and after in that sense um and it wasn't bad it was just very much like this is an introductory course it's kind of like yeah fine not for me but this is great but i had to, everyone had to take it kind of thing everyone had to take it so yeah interesting so would you say i mean a lot of folks get into programming with games that's my story yeah. too which is Same. you know another yeah. you know <laughs> conversation i guess but uh game maker like played games and just again kind of got curious as a tinker and said, how do I make them? Or mm. again, how did that sort of come about? When do you remember downloading Game Maker? Mm. I was about, I must have been nine or 10 years old, probably 10 years old actually. And that's when I did it and I remember doing it. It was quite, it was, it was, it was enjoyable learning how to do it, but it was also like, none of this made any sense. It was like, what, what, what was all this thing? Blah, blah, blah. It was all weird. And it is even like looking back on it, I'm like, yeah, no wonder I got confused. It really was weird. Um, but again what else you don't know anything else as a kid you're literally just trying to find out like how do i even do this mm -hmm. and yeah <laughs> it's the best way of putting it. it's just you scrap things together you find other people's projects and you kind of can cannibalize their their projects to learn how they worked mm -hmm. so then you can make your own from it and eventually even though they had to make a 3d game in it which was quite say, what do you mean game makers 2d at the time it was at least um and i was like well i learned how to do it i learned all oh, 3d is just perspective so you can effectively i just made like a wolfenstein clone is what i did dungeon crawler wolfenstein clone kind of thing which is great but that was learning how to just re draw rectangles at different perspectives <laughs> kind of thing <laughs> which is good fun i learned a lot doing that a lot of mathematics and stuff like that but that's kind of thing is i've always kind of i, I love learning kind of things it's used to call it tinkering but i've just kind of like i like understanding how many things work mm -hmm. in like across the board in that field. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I mean, if we search the internet, I always give my my students a challenge because yeah. I, I have a similar story where if you search mm. hard enough on these game maker and stuff forums, you'll find my questions. I mean, can we find some of your creations uh, anywhere? <laughs> the short answer is you won't be able to, you, but the you'll be able to some of my games that are much later on. For instance, a lot of my Ludum Dare entries. Mm -hmm. Um, so I used to enjoy doing them. Um, I haven't done them for many years now, but I used to love doing it because I used to, oh, I tried many different languages, many things. Sometimes I did one, I think I did one in full on C++, one's in C, one was in like Wasm, one was in Odin, kind of to try different things going throughout the years, just trying different languages out, including my own. But because, hey, you make a game, you get to try some new tool out. Can you make it, can you make it in 48 hours? If not, oh well. And there was a lot of entries that I never completed because uh, either I didn't have enough time or something else came up or I got halfway through the game like this is a bad game okay I'm just gonna give up kind of thing because that's the things you don't always know when you into these jams if the game's gonna be any good <laughs> that's what it is yeah I mean it's always nice I guess um to have some sort of constraint I suppose of 48 hours try to scope it out yes. figure out what you can do and I mean inevitably you probably learn something from each one of these games that you oh yeah about. it is a lot of it's just time management really as well um that is a huge huge skill to have though Mm -hmm. A lot of programmers don't usually have that as well, which is hard because it's a skill you have to like learn by yourself. No one can really teach you that mm -hmm. um, to a certain extent. Um, that might be, you know, I'm going to jump around here a little bit on some of my yeah, uh, research on do. you, but one of my, uh, you know, as I was getting ready for this conversation, I looked at some of your articles and you have a bunch of programming proverbs that I thought were really great Yes, uh, that I do want to kind of dive into. But one that... You know, I started typing them out, the quotes that you had, but yeah. this one was so good. You had this section on just management. I just took a screenshot of it, yeah. <laughs> but, it might yeah, nice. um, but it's on uh, management. And the very first uh, bullet point is, you know, simplicity is complicated. Uh, yes. And then clear is better than clever. I'll just kind of talk about those yeah. first two. I mean, and you talk about 
doing a game in 48 hours. You have all these yep. really grand visions of what you're going to do, but you know, simplifying and getting something done is hard, right? I mean, is that just yes. software development in general? Uh, building really yeah, clear, simple much. code? Yeah, yeah too, like, I remember doing one and I remember got completely finished. And it was literally a dodge the thing game. That's what it was. Mm. Literally, it was, it was a Christmas time. And I thought, I, I literally, the theme was like, okay, great. I'm, I'm just going to do a game I know I can complete. And it was literally, I had things falling down, which is it was, it was like catch the present kind of thing. It was like, oh, here's all the cold and snow and falling down. And you got a present that's moving around. And then I, I was animated, so it's dead easy collision detection. I did it all kind of, I think it was open gel at time and stuff. I also added music to that as well, even recorded. It was like deck the halls, something like that. And I even did it on the piano and wrote, did all the songs and all the chimes. So I, I knew I had a full polished product, but... It was something like, I know it's not matching the theme, but it's like, look, I know what the constraints are. I need to get this done. But um, yeah, this, the Proverbs thing to explain why that even came about was because uh, people kept asking me for like, advice to a certain extent. Because I'm like, I'm not, why are you asking me advice? The first thing I was asked. <laughs> I'm going to ask you more today too. <laughs> no, but the uh, it was more of a, like, okay, how if I was going to ask someone else for advice, I'm like, how would I write it? But the problem is, I'm not a very good writer. And the way that I think is not in like full on prose. So I thought, okay, you know what? Let's just actually write the way that I think about things, which is kind of more short and sweet in a more proverbial style. And that came more naturally to me. So when I wrote this down, this was probably 20 minutes mm -hmm. it took just to write that pragmatism in programming proverbs article. And then I found the quotes because I knew most of them off my heart. I'm like, and I need the right exact quote. Just, just put them in there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that's it done. Like that was like, okay, that was dead easy. But when people ask for advice, I always go like, oh, just here, read this kind of thing because I've written it already. That's the whole point I did it for. But it was like certain things in there are just like, to a beginner, there may be very terse information, but it's like, I wish I knew this when I was kind of like learning. You're not as like a true beginner, but I mean like mm -hmm. when I was learning stuff, because there's a lot of times like, okay, simplicity is complicated. Let's take that one you just said. Well, what's simplicity? What's simple? Well, people mix up the word simple because it either means simple, as in opposite of hard, or it could mean simple, the opposite of complex, as in simplex in this case, mm -hmm. right? Simplex and, and easy are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Things that can be very complex are actually very easy sometimes. And things that are simplex can be very complicated. So when I'm saying simplicity is complicated, is when people are trying to think, they're getting these concepts mixed up, which again, why, why would they know the difference a lot of the time? Mm -hmm. Which is absolutely fine. It's like, look, simplicity is complicated to do and make things look, be actually simple and simplex, easy, whatever things. It takes a lot of effort and knowledge to know how to do that. So when you're thinking like, oh God, this thing's so simple. Like it should be simple. Why am I struggling? Like it's not as simple as you think. Mm -hmm. It really isn't. Don't worry about that. Um, and I think that's where a lot of people kind of get caught up. It's just like your expectations aren't matching reality. And it's like, well, you've got to update your expectations. <laughs> I don't think. Yeah, I think there was something else in these proverbs. They don't have all of them in front of me. But when right. like, you know, hard things are hard or, you know, that might have been something yeah. from Mike Acton. Uh, maybe that was yeah, one yeah. of his quotes. Um, but I mean, that kind of falls into that. You know, some things are simple, but some things are hard. And that's just the nature yeah. of it. So you just oh, yeah. manage that complexity, I guess. Um, oh yeah, there's, there's loads of stuff. I mean, in that article, there's what probably one of them is my favorite quote is what I think the first one, which is uh, programming is a tool to solve problems that you have in the domain of computers. Mm -hmm. Everyone forgets what programming is all the time. Like they think it's something more than that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it's, it, it is just that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people try and it's all this, I know it sounds like such a simple thing. Like, of course it's that. I'm like, no, no, no. The amount of people who forget that and they get st stuck down trying to solve problems. It's like, they're not even trying to solve a problem. They're trying to solve something else, which is not even related to their problem anymore. It's like, what are you doing again? Oh yeah, you're meant to be programming. What, what pro problem are you solving with programming? Like, oh, I'm doing this. Well, we'll do, we'll do that then, please. <laughs> and I think, um, it'll be better for you in the long run. Yeah, I kind of find myself, you know, falling in this trap sometimes where, you know, you learn a cool new feature about a programming language yeah. and it's like, oh, I've got to use this. And it's actually making things way more complicated. And maybe maybe that's my own excuse for just like not getting some work done. I mean, is that something? Oh no, no, but everyone falls that into that cap. <laughs> I do as well. That's why I wrote it. I'm like, you have to remind yourself, what is it actually doing? Oh yeah, you, you're problem solving. Mm -hmm. Getting distracted is fine, but make sure you've actually got the time to get distracted. Mm -hmm. And 
also not just that is that distraction even worthwhile because that you will find a, very quickly is it worthwhile or not mm -hmm. but sometimes you have to remind yourself that as well because sometimes again when you're learning as a beginner you're listening to all the advice of uh, ex experts out there i know a good example of this would be when i was learning all of the modern c++ stuff like c++ 11 mm -hmm. and i remember just going through it all and going like well this seems like i'm doing extra work but i trust these experts they know what they're talking about but i just didn't see it and eventually i was like got through it all i went yeah, I'm just writing stuff. I don't even understand what I'm doing. Or I'm it's like, I don't need to do this. Can I just go back to something simpler? But it took, it was kind of the, I was taking the advice of the people I thought were experts as well. Mm -hmm. But they're not. They're just regular people, mm -hmm. which is fine. Like, I'm a regular person. Don't have to take my advice. That's the thing. <laughs> Always question it as well, to a certain extent. But also, see if it does actually work for you. That, that kind of the crux of the matter there. Yeah, kind of going to the, you know, the mantra of Odin, uh, you know, sane software development, mm. if I can sum yeah. it up. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what I've tried to do as a oh. catch line, which I know some people are like, oh, you call everything else insane? Insane? I'm like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is something interesting, this this journey. You know, we're always looking for mm. wisdom and these types of things. I mean, yeah. so, so I'm a teacher. That's my, like, full-time thing when I don't yeah. do software development. But um I, I wonder how do I teach my students these lessons? I mean, is is it just sometimes you just have to go into the, you know, write enough programs that you figure out, oh, actually, I just want to write really simple code that, you know, works and I can read it, not all this like fancy stuff. I mean, is there any like, how, how do we accelerate that? Or is the, you just do it long enough and you kind of learn? <laughs> I, I, unfortunately, it is just long enough and you'll kind of learn. Um, but I think the reason why is because this, this uh, discipline, this industry, is so young mm -hmm. compared to engineering, which is thousands of years old. Compared to modern science, I'm being very technical. The modern science is only about or 500 years old. Mm -hmm. um, like these programming is what 70 years. That's mm -hmm. someone's lifetime. Mm -hmm. Like when the first program came around, someone was still alive. There would be today, and the, it hasn't been gone on long enough to have enough like evolutionary selection pressure. To tell us which is the bad things and the good things so a lot of the time people are just working on like hype or fads or fashions or whatever thing like and that sort when actually that we're still looking for that wisdom mm -hmm. but it hasn't been found yet in many ways and unfortunately this is this is the i wish it was a quick way of doing it but there isn't you just kind of have to plod through it and learn it as you go along mm -hmm. and hopefully things get better rather than literally looking for fashions like oh what's the best silver bullet you can have i'm like unfortunately fred brooks is right there is no silver bullet mm -hmm. and uh yeah you've just got to plod through i know that's horrible isn't it as an educator like yourself but there's certain things you can teach people which is great mm -hmm. but then the nitty-gritty things like the actual like complicated things and the complex things it, it unfortunately you have to do it through experience and there's not much of the, currently yet eventually probably in 100 years time it might be better mm -hmm. but but not there yet. Yeah. Sorry, I, that sounds a bit pessimistic, but I'm not. I'm actually optimistic, <laughs> very optimistic. It's just we're not there yet. Yeah. No. No. I I, I think that's that's great advice. And again, you know, it, it is some wisdom of what I'm finding. Sometimes you just put students mm. in the gauntlet. You send them to an internship, and then they kind of figure out what's important and important yeah. in their domain too, right? Because as you said, yeah, it's very domain yeah. specific. Yeah. You know, you listen to experts talk and you know, if they're game programmers versus working on databases or something else, right? Mm. It's a very, very different, uh, you know, problem set that you're working with. Uh, so it's it's kind of interesting to think about. Um, yeah. I want to get into one of these other uh, proverbs, I guess, that uh, spoke to me uh, as being a game programmer as well. It said, uh, yeah. once you go generic, you lose information about the specific and being generic is rarely what you want. Um, yes. So I'm wondering, um, was this something that you thought about in a particular domain or after writing programs? And I can tell you where I'm coming I, from. I was actually just writing mostly programs. I remember, again, it was that C++11 phase, which is back, what, 13 years? Mm -hmm. 10, what, what, 10 to 13 years ago, I was going through that phase. And um, yeah, the the thing was, I was trying to make generic things. I'm thinking, you know what, I might need this for later. Or I can generalize this now. Why don't I just generalize it now? And every single time, without exception, I didn't need to generalize it ever. I only had it needed once. It was instantiated once. And it was very much like, I shouldn't be generalizing this. I should just write the problem I need to solve the problem now. And then if I see it being repeated, 
then try and see the pattern to to generalize it. But usually that pattern was still very specific to that set of domain of problems. So yes, you've generalized, but, but the thing is loads of people have this problem. I see it in beginners all the time. They try and generalize so much mm -hmm. and it's like, just write the, literally write the code at the same time. Literally, if you want to write the code three times in a row, the same thing, that's actually better sometimes because mm -hmm. then you can see the pattern. Don't try and apply a pattern firstly, like the general pattern. Mm -hmm. See the pattern and then see it rise. It's kind of a, mm -hmm. yeah, you know what I mean? So people apply patterns before they even know what the pattern's meant to go to. Yeah, so, so, same experience for me writing games. I found out, mm -hmm. you know, if you write a matrix or a vector library, it's like, well, I'm just using a float every single time, so why don't I use that? But I realized maybe I got this habit from when I learned, you know, object-oriented programming and yeah. templates. You know, building a templated matrix library is a great, you know, example yeah. program. And it, it serves that purpose, but you don't really figure it out like, okay, I'm just solving this one problem. Yeah. And it's it's good enough. I mean, again, you can make arguments for templated or not templated, whatever. Uh, just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I'm not being very careful. I'm not criticizing <laughs> yeah. those tools either. Yeah. I'm more just saying that if you're defaulting to them, you're probably not using the right tool yet. Mm -hmm. Like eventually, you do sometimes you should make it generic, and that is absolutely fine. Like a good example, just data structures. Like, oh, I need to make this um, generic data structure every single time. I'm like, mm -hmm. and you've used it probably five times. Like, yeah, it might be a good idea to generalize that now. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm probably this is probably a bit radical. I'm like, even if I've just you made this data structure twice i may not even generalize it yet mm -hmm. because if it's only twice i'm like they might have specific use cases and they usually are later on they have to specialized but if you have it enough times that are about the same i'm like yeah i'll, I'll generalize mm -hmm. now which is i know very weird advice to give <laughs> copy code <laughs> like write loads more code than than trying to simplify it down like yeah but and so he's oh that's gonna be bug prone i'm like yes it will be bug prone mm -hmm. <laughs> but you'll know what the problem is <laughs> yeah, that's right. The the error messages will be easy. Hopefully, you'll know exactly yeah. the line code. Yeah. yeah. Um, it kind of goes to a story. One of the best programmers I worked with, he he broke all the rules. And that's, again, one yeah. of these things where I just had to work in industry for a little bit to figure out, yeah, you yeah. can write 20,000 lines of in one C++ file. You know, you can do that. Uh, yeah, you should look at my Odin there. source code. Yeah. The Odin compiler is pretty much that. There's some files with 10,000 lines in them. Yeah. It's not a problem. Yeah. Like people think, oh God, that's going to be a problem. Like, you know, text editors have search functionality, right? <laughs> like, oh no, oh no, like mm -hmm. people think, what do you mean? Like, you know, that's not actually hard to navigate through. Yeah. It's just that people think it is, but it's actually, it, it, it's, it's weird. It's all of the stuff you think get taught, which is actually not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. And that sounds really bizarre, but it, it really is. If people are getting listening out, it's like, no, it, it kind of is true. You'd be surprised. Yeah. But but you just have to go through it, do it once, yeah. see that somebody else is doing it, and it's okay in certain you know situations or whatever. Yeah, it's, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Again, not every single case, but it's very much the I can't give you general rules for specific problems. As to go back to the original point, but you, you can't. And that's the thing: is different domains have different problem sets. Yeah. Unfortunately. Uh, which kind of perfectly goes with this next quote, which I'm curious yeah. about where you grab some of these from. Uh, but this is from William James. Who says the yes. art of being wise is the art of knowing what to overlook? <laughs> yes. Yeah. William James, for people who don't know, was a was a philosopher of the nineteenth century, correct? Yeah. Who's the one who came about pragmatism? Now, my article pragmatism is it's actually related to the term. His mm -hmm. form pragmatism is a bit weird, uh, but there are some lovely insights I remember from reading him um, and many other philosophers in general, actually, because you can always just find wisdom in them. That, I love that little quote as well. Because it is very much what is wisdom, mm -hmm. or not being that. What is the, what is the state of being wise? And it's like, yeah, you know, what to, to ignore, yeah. overlook, as he would say. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, it's it's very wise. <laughs> yeah, 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 it is. Yeah. And I always try to tell you know folks that I talk to to get a second opinion. You know, I'm in a power of position. Maybe the same for you. When folks ask about mm. Odin, uh, you're being yeah. very very good today in saying you know this is just an opinion or you know uh, yeah. what to do. Because yeah, it's it's hard to know what advice applies to you. You you have to figure it out on your own, I suppose. Unfortunately, yeah. No, <laughs> no, no shortcuts for us. So, yeah. I wish there were. I really wish there were. <laughs> um, so you know, thinking about some of these things, I think we'll visit a few more of these proverbs. Yeah. But um, during your time, uh, you know, kind of learning modern C plus plus, and maybe 2011, and maybe a few years later, mm. I noticed you had the uh, the GB libraries uh, that yes. you developed. 
Um, was that something that you were developing uh, for your work at the time or sort of on the side for the game projects uh, to sort of, again, you know, take some code that you were using yeah. and uh, reuse it? So this was actually, uh, so this was back in 2016. So mm -hmm. I was inspired by, actually 2015, technically I watched it, but I was inspired by a talk by Sean Barrett. Mm -hmm. And it was effectively, Sean Barrett, for people who know, he is the creator of the STB libraries. And he also worked at Rad Games Tools and many other things back in the past. And I thought he worked uh, I don't know how to word. Looking Glass Studios, the game studio one as well. And he had a talk. It was called How He Pretty Much Pro How He Programs in C. And it's not it's not very well, very well polished as a talk, but that one was extremely eye opening to me because it was very much like, hey, here's how he programs in C, and not just that what he did and how he why he created the STB libraries and such. And effectively, it was just like light bulbs going off all the time. I was like. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Like a good example is he was on its forum from like literally decades ago and people were showing like how to solve this problem in their, in their, um, their favorite scripting language. And then he just showed his, this is how I do it and see. I'm like, wait, I was looking at it. I went, it's the same amount of lines of code. Oh yeah. The language isn't actually the problem here. And I think to a certain extent, a lot of it is just actually it's the, it's the libraries. People think C is really hard to use and it is to a certain extent, but there's not any actually decent libraries for C. So, but I, it was kind of like two things kind of went off. That was the first one is the libraries thing. It was like a big revelation. Actually, the languages themselves aren't necessarily the biggest thing you need to get ready. But the second thing was also like, actually, I can get really far in C. And I did start off learning C in that sense. <laughs> and then went to C++. And then I kind of came to that realization a few years ago. I'm like, I need to go back to C. Uh, because C++ is too much for me. It's too complicated for me. There's too much in it. Um, so my New Year's resolution for 2016 was every personal project that I start has to be written in C, mm -hmm. every single one. Mm -hmm. And not just that, I knew as well, and as I went along, I compiled a lot of the stuff I already written in other projects and then compiled them into library and then started improving as I went along as well. So that's where the GB libraries came from. So those GB libraries are a collection of the C code that I was having to reuse a lot and make it into a, into a standard library, which is honestly better than the C standard library because everyone replaces that as well. Mm -hmm. But then eventually I started, as I was getting further on, I was noticing actually C does have its flaws, but the problems I had with C are not fixed with C++, surprisingly. All, I was like, hmm, what? So, so eventually I was trying to augment it, make a main augmented C compiler with own features and like added defer, I added slices. And that was actually getting a lot further as well. I was really happy just adding those two features. Um, like a proper array type, oh my God, you, it's so much beneficial in C. You'd be surprised. Even C++ technically doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. You can try and do as best as you can, but it won't be, even with the syntax. But then eventually I got to the point, it was about July time, uh, early July, late June, uh, early July time. And then I went, look, I need to just create my own language. So that's how Odin came about. Mm -hmm. So it was very much like after six months, I kind of got fed up <laughs> of not just programming C, but just trying to fix it and realizing I can't fix C. Mm -hmm. So yes, the language isn't actually that important, the libraries are, but you still need a decent like foundation, which is the language itself. And C is just broken. So that's kind of the journey of GB as well to Odin. Okay. Um, Perfect. Yeah. So a, a bunch to kind of unpack there. I mean, that's an interesting... Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that is something that draws people to different languages when you have a standard library or packages, right, that you can just install and yep. get started quick, right? That's a, a selling yes. point. And that's how most people think what a language is as well. When you ask them what Python is, um, especially many of my old colleagues when I was a physicist, they'd go, Python, yeah, yeah, it's got, it's got, it's got NumPy and Cytools and Matplotlib <laughs> in it. And I'm like, that's not Python. They're just third party libraries. Well, no, that's like, that's Python. I'm like, they did not separate the language from the ecosystem. And people don't, even to this, like most people don't, even big programmers. So when they're talking about, all oh, I love Go, like the language, I'll say Go is an example. Mm -hmm. What they mean is it's not necessarily the language they love, but like, oh, look look at the standard library that they have, all this all thing. It's got the networking package, the HTTP stuff, the templating stuff. It's like, oh, I love all this. It's like, okay, which is not a criticism at all. It's just very much like, I love to see how people conceptualize things as well, because that is actually how people are going to use the things. Mm -hmm. You can't, even though they are easy to make distinctions from, people don't do that. Mm -hmm. Sorry to cut you in your conversation there, but yeah. No, no. Um, I mean, yeah. what do you think? I mean, there's a lot of inertia with these libraries too, as far as mm. if you ever get someone to try to switch or try out a language, right? You yes. kind of, one, you're either thinking in that language. I mean, I, I find I think in C or C++. I mean, yes. that's what I learned on uh, forever. And then I'm also 
constantly comparing the library like oh i wish i had this data structure or this library um i mean do you see that sort of um when folks are coming to odin for instance are they um coming because kind of similar they're fed up with you know dealing with errors in some other language or some difficulties and something's kind of easy to do in odin mm. is that kind of the initial sell or i, I don't know what do you what do you sort of see because changing programming languages what i've a... been seeing is quite interesting so um in the early days it was just people who fed up with c and c++ mm -hmm. pretty much and they wanted a better language and at the time in 2016 the alternatives really out there were was rust mm -hmm. that was it and they were like, yeah, we don't like we don't like the new the modern C++, so we don't, definitely don't want to do Rust, kind of view. And again, not a criticism of Rust, it's just a, some people don't like certain things. It's like, yeah, we didn't want that. So it's like, okay, again, at the time, there wasn't anything else. I know there's other languages that were in development. Um, I think another one was also out there was also NIM, but that was, again, by default was garbage collected. So if you wanted manual, mem manual memory management, it, it was very limited to what choices you had. So clearly I was trying to make something new. But I've, I've been finding a lot of people, and again, they have the same route. They're coming from C or C++ and coming to Odin. But some people are also coming from more higher-level languages, I've noticed, recently at least. Mm -hmm. uh, again, Go was a good example I was trying to say. People like Go, but they want to be more low-level, have control over memory layout and allocations mm -hmm. and such. Uh, there's some people I've seen coming from like even scripting languages like Python, which is surprising me. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting to see what... And again, it's just... I think but a lot of people, interestingly, are using Odin to make games or graphical applications in general, in fact. And there's nothing inherent about Odin that makes that easier. Mm -hmm. It's just we do package a lot of libraries to help you with that. That's kind of the thing. It's more of the, oh, you've got libraries already built in with Raylib or OpenGL or Direct3D. I'm like, great, we can use it. I'm like, yeah, but it's not the language itself that's helpful. Mm -hmm. But then people do stay because of the language. It's kind of interesting. Like, oh, actually, this I didn't realize I had all these issues when I was programming in language X. And they don't exist anymore. And I'm like, yeah, I've tried to solve them. I tried at least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, do you think, you know, some of the additions to other languages, I mean, languages are always evolving, right? So we're seeing yes, exactly. C23 coming out. I mean, is it mm. fixing enough problems that make it a, you know, interesting enough language that, you know, folks can use C and sort of use it safely or, uh, or um, what do you think about C23 mm. or C26, whatever? <laughs> there are some interesting aspects to c23 um if i was ever to use c again like fully i'd probably stick at c11 myself mm -hmm. um I, or yeah because it's one it's portable but it also is like yeah some nice features to c23 they really are uh, but at the same time i'm like c is there i i, I wouldn't need to start a new project in c now clearly i've got odin but mm -hmm. C is broken. Like it is actually broken as a language, and they can't actually fix many of the things because they are fundamental to language. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to fix those things is means you've got a new language mm -hmm. fundamentally. I'm not saying people shouldn't learn C. I'd recommend people learn C actually because it will actually help you learn other languages, mm -hmm. like loads of other languages, because loads of them have been influenced from C. C is also usually people's first introduction to pointers. As mm -hmm. What they mean is manual memory management and the concept of memory addresses in general. And that is their, usually their first introduction. And C does actually help with that as a learning. I know it helped me to a certain extent, but there's a lot of things that also C muddles together. And, and this is where, I don't know, it's hard to answer. It just is. It's just a, there's a lot of, I'm not saying everyone should learn Odin. I really don't. Um, it's just that C is probably still something that sh people should learn. But are the new versions like 23 going to help? I'm like, maybe I, I doubt it though yeah it's an interesting thing you know i follow programming languages try to learn a bunch yeah. um i mean certainly if your language isn't growing then maybe you know or the ecosystem isn't growing maybe yeah. people just aren't using it um and that's maybe a sign but uh, obviously people are still using c um yes yeah and they will be for the next oh god 50 years i bet yeah i'm i'm sure it'll be forever right <laughs> if folks yeah. are still using COBOL and forth and fortran yeah. etc um, which are also evolving languages in their own right. Um, so it's very Oh, yeah, indeed, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, the, uh, and the joke about fourth is once you've seen a fourth, you've seen a fourth. They're all different. <laughs> That's the thing. You, every, you can implement your own fourth that easily as well. And you're like, it's got to be like any other, any other fourth. That's the thing. But again, mm -hmm. our languages evolve and so do our tools and so do our needs. Mm -hmm. that, that, our computers today will not be the computers of the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very fair. Um, I think it's also interesting thinking about C, and, and I'm talking about C because I know that's part of the evolution to 
um, yes. Odin here is, uh, again, going back to one of your proverbs. I loved all these. I'm going to share these with my students. Sure, sure. Um, but the, the proverb, this particular one is, the purpose of a program is and ought to be something that transforms data into other forms of data, uh, which is exactly yeah. after I learned C and after I said work with it a while, mm. my model changed to C as just a data layout language. That's all it is. You just yeah. take some data, transform it, and that's pretty much it. Um, so I thought that was quite wise. Um, yeah, thank you. But I think with Odin, uh, if we could start to you know sort of describe the language uh, as I understand it, again only with a few hours yes. of browsing and trying things out. Yeah, it's fine. Um, you know, it's a uh, improvement on C. It's a array-based language, so mm. again, data transformations, yes. and allowing you to do that with lots of control and efficiency. So again, the manual memory management, yep. uh, things like some D instructions, and you know these types of things for performance. Um, I mean, is that a accurate portrayal on the evolution? Yeah, no, I would say so. Yeah, one thing that many people not may not realize is that Odin started off as a Pascal clone. Mm -hmm. And if you actually look at the compiler internally, it's actually like a Pascal language. So many semantics within it are very Pascal-like, but I've tried to tweak it enough to make so that C programmer would feel at home in many ways. Mm -hmm. And I think this is sometimes where my personal view is like Pascal was, is the Pascal family, I should be very careful, the Pascal family is actually better than C. Mm -hmm. But the problem is C won out. And for many reasons, in fact, the early Pascal was a teaching tool from Nikla, uh, now the late Nicolas Viet, unfortunately, he died uh, at the beginning of this year. And, but that's the thing, it was just a teaching tool, so it wasn't a fully fledged language. So many people eventually made it started in correcting the issues and stuff that C actually improved on. But then you had the problem you had so many different dialects of different Pascals out there. Mm -hmm. When in C, really, there was never any dialects. It's like there's the C language and then there's the GNU variant, and that's it. Surprisingly, there, may be, there were some others, but they all died out. Um, and eventually, of course, I'd see, I'd see with glasses, obviously, but an objective C, but that sounds like a lot, but I'm no, actually, they are kind of diff different languages at that point. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the thing. So it's kind of like there is a C lineage. It's like I wanted a C alternative for my domain, but at the same time, it's like it's actually very heavily influenced on the Pascal family. Like it is actually kind of a Pascal internally. Hmm. Interesting. Um, makes sense. Um, mm. Maybe we'll even uh, screen share. It'd be interesting. I, I mm. mean, maybe now's the appropriate time if I shared my screen mm. here. Let's see. Uh, just to the Odin demo as we're talking about the language and yes. um, can maybe show some of the influences. Because I think I saw a few from uh, mm -hmm. what I would say. Let's see. Uh, let me actually just make sure I select the correct window here. Let's see. Let's share this. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So hopefully. Okay, we see some code okay. here. <laughs> yeah, I see the code. Yes, uh, your your code here, um, but you know, with uh, so Pascal was an influence. I think Go was another maybe influence. Yes, that's correct. Well. Yep. Okay. Yeah, Go is in the Pascal family as well. So yeah. Great, great. Um, I mean, so a few things. So if I just kind of, I'm just gonna kind of scroll through here. I'll point to a few things, yep. and maybe we could just talk about them. I mean, so even from the start, we've got a package system and. Uh, imports. So is this a sort of yes. modules? Uh, it's fair to say I write one piece of code and I have this module system for compiling things? Or Yep. Yeah, yeah. So a directory in Odin, a package is a directory. So a package is a directory that contains Odin files. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's very simple. But it's very well defined as what package is, mm -hmm. which many languages don't actually have a very well defined concept. So, so they try and have the, that's why I was trying to solve that problem at least. So, so no header files, no you know mixing up nope. all this kind of complicated stuff. Yeah. No, nope. there's no need for a header file when header files were back in the day when you had single pass compilers. Mm -hmm. So the compilers would literally go in literally from the top to the bottom, and they needed some forward declarations. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, I'm like I can afford to make an AST and pass over the AST afterwards. Mm -hmm. How how is Odin as far as compiling? Um, the language is there things like uh, separate compilation of files, or is it doing builds concurrently? Uh, so so how it works at the moment is um, you you pass in your initial directory that you want to build or mm -hmm. file whatever, and then it goes as it goes through the parser, it finds the new imports and searches out the new things it needs to build. Mm -hmm. And each each file, by the way, gets pushed onto a worker thread, and those concurrently passed because again it's how it's it's a context free grammar in that lovely sense so you have each file can be passed independently from each other mm -hmm. um 
Other than that, then the other thing is once you've got the files, everything is in the compiler, everything compiled. By default, we actually compile as one translation unit, mm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, you can always opt in to have multiple translation units if you want, which is called the use separate modules um, flag mm -hmm. on the compiler. So each package will be built separately and then linked together mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing. But it, most of the time, we just have to do one translation unit because that is usually faster because the linkers usually sometimes your bottleneck. At the moment, LVM is our bottleneck full stop, so mm -hmm. it doesn't help. But yeah, that's sometimes the case. And also, computers are so fast nowadays. Like, There's no reason for necessarily to split it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Uh, mm. fast, fast compile times matter. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, they do. Uh, especially in... Again, uh, I'm, I'm going to speak to games because that's what I know. But uh, <laughs> you know, no, no. Uh, great, you know, iteration times are important here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so just pulling out some things here. Proc. I mean, I'm gathering this proc procedure from what I remember from Pascal. Yep, that's correct. Um, and then let's see here. We've got colon colon here. So let's see. Are we setting up a namespace or something, or what's going on here? Is this so this is uh, the first column means we, it gets, you got the the basics is a is a name and identifier. We're mm -hmm. declaring this. So that's the first colon. Mm -hmm. After that first column would be an optional type, mm -hmm. and then the second colon is saying, hey, this is now being uh, declared with this expression, so it's an actual constant. Mm -hmm. So this is a compile time constant named the basics with the expression of a procedure. Mm -hmm. If that was an equal signs after the first colon, it would be a variable, mm -hmm. as we'll show later on in the demo. Got it, got it. So yeah. again, uh, Pascal uh, influence. I, I love the uh, colon. Kind of, actually. This is new squeak <laughs> influence, oh, okay. actually, which is a Rob Pike language. This is from his language back in the early 90s. Oh, very good, very good. OK, we got to read our Rob Pike uh, proverb, too, yeah. later. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's see. So I'm seeing some stuff here. Again, uh, handling the arguments, uh, formatting and printing stuff out. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is all. Yes. Uh, let's see here. I think, you know, again, when I was researching, is there a story behind this? Uh... Yeah, the short answer is I remember hearing a woman kept saying hello, not hello. <laughs> okay. And she kept insisting on saying the word hello, and it just kept making me laugh. So it's <laughs> something I remember. That's all it is. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, that's funny. OK, so part of the, the history here is is preserved forever then. <laughs> Pretty much, yes. So I'm keeping the word hello rather than hello world. <laughs> and by the way, I actually own hello.world as well. So I do own that domain name. Excellent. We'll, we'll link it in the description <laughs> here and uh, keep an eye it, on it. It literally just takes the, takes the Odin website. That's all it does. But yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, let's see. OK, so here is uh, setting up some variables here. Yes. Uh, all right. Uh, and then we've got the same comments, the same style as C. Uh, let's yes, see. Here. Yeah. Uh, and I'll go through this. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I don't know. This is like a thousand lines, but no, no. Uh, just kind of look at Yeah, yeah. It. It's pretty much a massive overview of the language in code yeah. itself. Yeah. Let's just kind of jump around here just to give our audience, um, you know, something set up to try. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Here. Um, yeah. So as I was looking through the loops here, uh, again, we don't have our parentheses. We have some, you know, shorter ways to do it. Yep. Uh, and let's see, I want to get to like, I think there were ranges ah, somewhere over here, uh, yes. which, I, which I quite, I quite like this for showing what was this the uh, in inclusive or exclusive uh, yep, yep. for the range. Uh, and then the dot dot, again, always reminded me of when I was learning Pascal for the, the range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. And originally it was, we did just have dot dot as the range. But then I'm like, oh, which one does this mean? Mm -hmm. Because in Pascal, it was inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, but Pascal was also it wasn't, how do I put this? There wasn't a definition of how like arrays work. Like you defined what the range was. Like it was like, oh, one dot dot the length. So mm -hmm. most people default to one index by default. Mm -hmm. But Odin would say, no, it's zero index by default. So in that regard, it's like the dot dot for Pascal was a bit confusing. Mm -hmm. So we just split that. It just said split them up to dot dot less than and dot dot equals mm -hmm. to actually have it clear mm -hmm. what the actual operation that's going on there. And most of the time, you want the dot dot less than approach rather than the equals one because mm -hmm. you are getting a zero index language. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I thought that was really yeah. clean. I mean, this is very mm. obvious. It's harder for somebody who's learning. And um, yeah, I mean, I love this again for like teaching because this is how we teach our students math with like the inclusive yeah. and you know ranges and so on. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought that was very. Uh, that was the no, first and I'd again, seen. the other thing is the dot dot syntax is ambiguous in different languages. Like if you go to different languages, it means different things. Right. So it's like I didn't want to add to that confusion. Right. Yeah. So it seems like I mean the the cognitive. I'm, I mean, just thinking about when programming. How important in Odin is it? Because this is a pretty concise and clean language, as as far as yeah. I was looking at Thank it. You. Um, but how much thought went into making this a language that's, you know, easy to read some of the code and just kind of, you know, taking away that cognitive overload so you could 
you know, do the fun thing. That was pretty the much the number one yeah. thing. Literally, reading is more important than writing. Mm -hmm. And you don't want noise in your reading either, mm -hmm. or not too much redundancy either. But that's the thing is like most of the time you are spending your code reading it, not writing it. And anyone who tells you otherwise is lying to themselves. <laughs> um, yeah. So you want it to be clear to read. Yeah. And, and I think, again, that's a hard, hard lesson. And it's one of those things only when you start working, you're like, okay, maybe modifying yeah. a few lines of code and changing my teammates or whatever code. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let's see here. Let's let's stop at these because um, this is another feature that probably once you use it, you can't get uh, you get used to, right? Having slices here. Correct. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no more point arithmetic. Oh, you don't need to deal with point arithmetic anymore. It's great. Yeah. Oh. So slices are great. The dynamic and uh, static arrays here. Yes. Um, and then one of my personal f uh, favorite features, again, what, where I learned from Go, um, and I mm. saw you had implemented, as you mentioned, in uh, C or C++ defer. Yeah. Um, are there constructors and destructors in Odin for nope. Odin? Just defer. Just data. There's no constructors or destructors like C++. You have to initialize yourself in that regard. How, how much did Everything that... is def When you initialize things, you um, initialize default to zero anyway, like the memory gets zeroed. Mm -hmm. Like in C, which you'd people hit those bugs all the time. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah, I think it's one of the number one vulnerabilities, uh, not initializing memory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, how, how much did that simplify the language itself, just getting rid of constructors and destructors? Uh... Um, they're actually, this is the funny thing, it doesn't actually simplify much at all. Okay. Like, it, if I wanted to add them, it's not hard to add, mm -hmm. but I actually came up from, like, I do not want these, because it, it, I wanted to be able to understand when things are happening, mm -hmm. rather than the magic of, like, C++ constructors and destructors in general. Right. Um, right. I actually kind of want to be explicit about things. And even if you've done like got game dev stuff, you'll see a lot of people, even in game dev, they'll use methods sometimes. Mm -hmm. But instead of constructors, they'll have an explicit init right. method on there. Right. And they call the init method itself. And that's because, unfortunately, when you have a constructor in C++, mm -hmm. it's coupling the allocation and the initialization together, which is what RAI is meant to do. I'm like, you, you don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. They are actually separate things. You want to allocate something mm -hmm. and then they want to initialize it later. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can do that in C++ with uh, in place new. No, for people who are going to see in the comments, but I'm like, it's not the same thing, really. It's it. You want to do, you kind of want to keep things separate as much as you can when you can. Yeah, hundred hundred percent. Um, and the same, yeah. That initialization shutdown pattern. Uh, we want yeah. control. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not even just control. It's readability. I'm like, oh yeah, this is now defer and delete. Yeah, sure, mm -hmm. perfect. Yep, very clean. I imagine. Um, so Odin uh, actually backing up to. Uh, defer and some of Odin. Uh, it's LLVM yeah. based, as you mentioned. Um, yeah. So is that is there tooling in you know libclang or these types of things or or anything um, being built? Short on answer is no. Odin? Short answer, okay. Short answer is we're just using LLVM library, um, and LLVM is a pain. It's a very undocumented mess, uh, <laughs> which we're trying to get away from as much as we can. But yeah, there's not much help out there. Like you just have to implement things manually. Short answer of it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I've worked in LLVM, and um, it's a big code base that's always changing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so and that's tricky. not a good thing either. Yeah. Don't, don't get me ranting. This would be a different conversation <laughs> otherwise. Really, really don't. Yeah. Well, let's let's keep moving on then. <laughs> let's see. Oh, yeah. another another feature. I mean, these are just little quality of life yeah, little things I can't uh, live without. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I steal these, and D is my other language of choice. Um, yeah, yeah, D is a good language, yeah. Which, uh, you know, does some of these things. So I, I love seeing this. Um, let's see, and we can yeah, ignore some values. Let me kind of keep scrolling through here. Th this was kind of neat here. Um, these, uh, let's see, these partial switches here. Let's see what was going on yes. here. Uh, so maybe we could see what's going on here. I've got a partial yeah, switch statement. Explain this. Um, it's when you pass like an enum, right? Mm -hmm. By default, we want you to handle every single case of the enum, mm -hmm. right? The default case, which is the empty case in Odin, if you just put that in, that doesn't, still means you haven't handled all of the cases either because mm -hmm. you have them. So all the partial switch does says, hey, can we ignore this thing and just say, look, we only actually want to handle a couple of the cases explicitly. Mm -hmm. And having it by default, this is, so, by the way, this has solved so many bugs for me in mm -hmm. like my own code. Because when you have a program in C, um, a switch, an enum isn't actually a type, it's just an integer. Mm -hmm. Like it is, it's not really a type. Yes, there are extensions to C compilers that allow you to do this, but problem is then they're pervasive and they do it everywhere and sometimes you don't want that either so it's like oh, you can't win mm -hmm. um and at least in this odin you can opt out in of these 
like check alls for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is awesome. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, missing a case or having fall through or something, uh, and, yeah. and being explicit about it, like you said. I mean, that sounds like right. We want control. We want to know exactly why we're doing this. This is part of the documentation. In it's, not sense. Even, it's not even control necessarily in this case. It's literally just preventing mistakes. Mm -hmm. Like obviously, I added a new enum. I'm like, whoops! Now the compiler's telling me I haven't updated these switch cases, which is great. I want the compiler to complain at me. Mm -hmm. it's, it's its job. Right. Yeah. We got to put our compilers to work. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. What else we got here? Okay, we've got uh, some functions here, uh, local functions too. I'll say. Yeah. Um, yeah, nested procedures. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Oh yeah, nested procedures. So, um, let's yeah. see. Okay, different cases with the ranges here. Great, all clean yep. stuff. Defer statement again. Nice um, example is here. Let's see. I'm just gonna try to scroll down just a little bit to see no you know, some new things here. Because uh, again, the, we don't want to do the whole language necessarily. <laughs> uh, let's see the win statement, uh, which just started popping up here. Hello. Okay, I think our connections broke up. Oh, okay. Can there you... we go. We're back again. We're right. back. I think we're back. <laughs> Ooh. All right. Just scrolling through here. Actually, I actually want to get to some of the uh, structure of array and array of structure stuff here. Sure. Because uh, I feel like that's a key component. Uh, let's see if I search around here. Structure array uh, SOA maybe. Ah, yeah, okay. there we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, structure of array versus array of structure. So obviously, uh, something that matters when we're thinking about performance and data layouts yes. uh, on these sorts of things. Um, can you just speak a little bit to you know, this feature? I think it's very well documented, I'll say, on the documentation. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if we need to scroll through this. But maybe for folks, um, just to understand, was this influenced again by game programming, shading languages? I mean, did this yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, so the idea, I, I'll be honest with you, I borrowed this from Jonathan Blow mm -hmm. originally. And I was like, the idea that you could switch between it. Now, the way he originally implemented it, I went, that's not right. Like, I, I was trying to figure out, like, how do I make it correct? And I was, I know the SOA-ness is not on the, on the type. Mm -hmm. It's actually on the array. And then it modifies the type kind of thing. It's like, okay, that's what you have to do semantically to make sense. But for people who don't understand what this is, um, if you're used to databases, instead of being row-oriented, it's being column-oriented. So literally, if you've got a row in your database, it's like, oh, you've got name, color, height, name, color, height, name, color, height. And that's how the memory will be laid out. If it's column oriented, it'd be name, 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 color, 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 height, 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 height. That is what is going on. And for certain access patterns, that is going to be faster to access than the row oriented approach. Now, the row oriented, we would normally call this an array of structures because we think of that row as a structure. While the structure of arrays, we're now thinking about those columns. We're thinking about the arrays of each field in that structure. So it's the array of names, it's the array of color, and the array of height, as I was using an example. In this one, I'm using vector three for some reason, but I was just showing X, Y, and Z. I don't remember why I was using that as an example, but I, I, that's why I wrote. So, yeah. And these are built in types, correct? Vector three, and there's a matrix well, type. And... We don't have a vector three type. The okay. type is just an array three of floats. Okay. Like literally, I have an array three of float. F F32, mm -hmm. and that will uh, work as a vector three. It'll have all the swizzling operations that you'd have from like GLSL, mm -hmm. has all of the um, array arithmetic, so you can actually add two arrays together, no problem. This all works as you'd expect, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, well, you, I think you wouldn't expect because most of the languages don't do this. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of more of a, well, what problems that people mostly have, especially in like, not to say just games, but loads of times, like, well, just add that in, kind of thing, rather than having it be, well, we could have a general pro solution in the language again, like, we'd have <laughs> operatable overloading and allow everyone to do this. I'm like, yeah, what do actually people try and solve? Okay, we'll solve those problems for them. Like, 99% of the time, this is what you want. Now, yeah. sometimes people ask for operatable loading. I'm like, yeah, you don't know what Pandora's box you want to open, do you? Yeah, we're not doing that. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. I mean, th this is one of my favorite features um, yeah. when I was looking through Odin, just... Uh, again, as somebody who's doing this on the, the game side, this totally makes sense. But as you said, in other domains too, I mean, you just want to yeah. swizzle some data or whatever. Um, yeah, 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 like um, with regards to not just the array programming, the SOA stuff, some people may not see the benefit even now. And I'm like, there's actually a benefit you may not even realize. If you type in there, it's, just search for the word zip. It should pop up. Here we go. Right, so for people who know and come from Python, uh, you know you're used to zipping things, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, you zip some multiple like iterators, you should say, just say arrays together, mm -hmm. and then you can iterate on that zip. Well, in this case here, we have three slices, and we can zip them together, and this produces a, an SOA struct, by the way, and then we can iterate over that. So now we're iterating over all three arrays at once, 
and it's being correct and how it's being handled. But the thing, how it's actually implemented at Odin is mean there's no temporary values being calculated mm. at all. Mm -hmm. It's all just direct memory access. So this is actually the correct high level. So it's a high level I idea like zip is like in Pyth Python, which is high level. But this is such a low level construct showing you actually that you can have the syntax and still have the performance. Wow, that's that's beautiful. Yeah. No, no temporaries yeah. here. Um... No, no. Um, the temporary thing is, if you're used to D, there's something you can do that in D, but it usually mm -hmm. creates a temporary, and hopefully the compiler optimizes it out. Is kind of what goes on. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, fingers yeah. crossed. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Um, let's see. Is there anything uh, else we should jump into that you'd be sad not to show folks? You know, just thinking about Odin in this demo. <laughs> That's a, good, that's a good question. I mean, there's uh, there's a, a lot of stuff, stuff in the language. There's I, probably a ton of stuff. But yeah, I recommend people going to the website and checking the overview. There's also the demos, which is in mm -hmm. when you download it, and it's in the example slash demo folder. Yeah. And um, folks, there's stuff yeah. in there. There's loads of stuff in there to it to show because the demo is kind of like a good code example mm -hmm. rather than like a like a text example, like explaining things. Like and that by the way, every time we build the Odin compiler, we run the demo as well, which generates it. Like we, when I saw you on the stream, you, you were surprised. Like, oh wait, it's done compiling. Like, no, it's not just compiled. It's compiled the demo and showed you the demo. Yeah, kind of thing. <laughs> and that's what we do. So yeah. I mean, huge, huge sell for me. I mean, again, the, the compilation speed, having the demo. I mean, it, it's yeah. just a well-engineered uh, system. I will say. <laughs> uh, I will say this is that the only reason it's fast to compile is because we don't really depend on anything. Yeah. Like we just compile the C. We don't. We use pretty much. You know, it's not a single translation unit. I think it's just two translation units, mm. and that's it. Mm -hmm. That's very awesome. And that's all you need to be as well. Like, I think people forget that the only reason your compile times are slow in some languages, at least, is because, well, you've made it slow. You, not not anyone else, not the compiler, you, which is <laughs> people don't like hearing that. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. I want to go ahead and, while I have us on the screen share, um, hop yeah. over to this, the, the showcase. Sure. Um, I mean, one, you know, there's tons of cool stuff here. Uh, let me actually open up the the news here. I think you have the newsletters. Yes. Um, but, you know, just as the developer of a programming language, how cool is it or, or what is the feeling to see other folks building stuff with, you know, your software? Like, and these are like it, it's hundreds surreal. of projects, right? It's surreal, literally. Like, it's like, if you told me back when I started Odin nearly, what, nearly eight years ago, I'd be like, Nah, that won't happen. What are you talking about? Nah. Like it was is literally not believable, but it's it's surreal to experience this and it, that surrealness does not go away, by the way. Mm. Um because again, this just started off as a hobby project. That's what it started off as. And it's amazing to see again some of the showcase here. We've these are probably should we add more to it, but these are literally professional products that people have put out there and sold. Like Cat and Onion is a game. Um a Carl, I can't remember, I can't pronounce your surname, so I won't bother. Carl Zed. Um and <laughs> Uh, I apologize, uh, but it's a really good game. This is actually coming out on Steam soon as well. So at the time of recording, at least it's probably already on Steam when people watch this. Um, it's a nice little game. It's all written in Odin as well. Uh, some brilliant things like Spall on there, which is a extremely fast profiler mm -hmm. that works on the web and natively on the computer. Literally, it, it, I put it this way, I'm like, this is thousands of times faster than the computer computation uh, competition out there. Yeah. Like, which is kind of like, wait, it's just a profile of what else is it meant to do? Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised at like even Google stuff, the new one they brought is so, so slow. So slow. And it's like, did they not profile their own code? <laughs> I was going to say, it's a bit of a head scratcher, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of funny. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. And again, there's some lovely things in the showcase. These are just these are the kind of the professional ones we've seen. OLS is also the only language server many people like to get IDE like features in their text editor. Mm -hmm. And that was done by Daniel Gavin. Um, I have had literally zero input onto that. But people love it. It's effectively another Odin compiler mm -hmm. in your that's so you can actually see how Odin works for you. That's pretty much what it is. Yeah, very, very cool. Yeah. Um and I know Spall to Duel, I think I saw these at Handmade Seattle twenty twenty two. There might have been some talks there. Uh, I think it was twenty twenty three. Was it twenty three? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, worth worth checking out uh, for those yeah. folks. I'll I'll add that to my list of things to link here, because <laughs> uh, fantastic tools. Um, and again, uh, for folks who haven't seen, I, I thought this was really cool just to see what's going on in the community. Every month, uh, you've got a newsletter yeah. that's being pushed out, and new software or updates on stuff that's being built. So uh, I just wanted to highlight that because 
yeah. that's that's super cool so i mean again it must be very cool for you to see every month oh yes uh, mike um i don't write these uh it's, it's guy terrace who writes these and these are wonderful things because showcasing people in the community or what they've done mm -hmm. a lot of it's games and stuff because it's all again it's visual the stuff that sometimes there's some things on there which aren't visual like they'll just say like here's a command line tool and it's great mm -hmm. but it is just amazing like wait you're doing this with odin and again, it's the surreal feeling doesn't go down. It's like you'll see like what what's going on and seeing what people are having so much fun. And actually, actually, again, having joy again in programming, it's kind of fun when you see it again. I know that sounds like the tagline of saying, oh, it's the joy of programming. I'm like, no, really, you, sometimes you don't forget how sad you are <laughs> <laughs> until you're like, oh, yeah, I don't have to deal with this nonsense anymore. I really don't. It makes me happier. Yeah, awesome. Um, so one project, I mean, it's worth, we mentioned it sort of at the start of our conversation. Uh, yes. Embergen. Uh, I at least want to click on. Uh, it's probably best to maybe just click on the website and let the yeah the sure real kind of. They, there's some beautiful animations. Um, I actually show my students this all the time because I'm like, you know, I teach graphics and want to tell them what's, you know, state of the art. So I show them Embergen and cool stuff here, and they want to know how to yeah. do physics. Um, but uh, so you've been at Jenga FX for you said four years now, about four years now, yeah, yeah, it's four years. Yeah. Um, and and how did that come about because were they using odin previously or um... they were yeah okay so the one of the co-founders which is uh, morton uh Basvik, is a good friend of mine anyway and he was one of the earliest users of odin as well mm -hmm. so when he met nick uh Sievert at the early days of when they would start jangra fx uh morton kind of said right can we not use c++ i'd rather just use odin because c++ is a pain sure answer of it mm -hmm. and nick went sure go ahead whatever Kind of thing, and so they were starting off with the projects and starting with the tools. And uh, Nick did try to get me on earlier to work on all this because, like, oh, you've made the language, why don't we get you on? Bill? And also, you're a physicist, aren't you? Like, Morton's a physicist as well. Like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, at the time I said, I actually said no the first time around because mm. I thought, oh, this might be risky. And then eventually, about I think it was like two months later, I went, yeah, I'll go, I'll join you, don't worry. It was kind of more <laughs> of a I had two months to mull on it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it really did. It, it's, I've never looked back. Really, it's 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 surreal to work for this as well because again, you're working for a company where there's a, probably a dozen programmers who are using your language daily, um, and we're making amazing products with them. Again, Embergen is it, it's industry standard at this point for games industry. Like you're making real time like fire, smoke, and explosions all the time. And again, if you look at the competition, some of the competition we're taking days, we're taking seconds. Mm -hmm. Like it's real time, like you're seeing it move. And it's like, I think people forget sometimes that actually performance matters and it's actually ha matters for the end product, the end, end, end user. Again, an artist doesn't want to wait weeks to render something. They want to see it then, tweak it and see how it goes on. And wouldn't you actually know how that, to actually give that out to the customer? They don't look back. It's just, oh God, it's just uh, that. And again, MGM is just our one out the first one we kind of did. So they released it in its very raw form back. It was just before I started it, four and a bit years ago. Mm -hmm. And then we eventually bring them out again, like back a year ago, we released 1.0. Recently, we just just before Christmas, released 1.1 mm -hmm. back in November. I think it was November, yeah, which is a big update as well. Uh, but then again, just before Christmas, we also released a new product called Geogen, and we've just released the closed alpha uh, Liquigen. So these are all our new tools. Um, it's in closed alpha at the moment, so if you've already got the suite, you can get Liquigen, but uh, we won't have to do a public alpha for a little while at least mm -hmm. until we've cracked down on a lot of the um, sharp edges is the best way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. I, I mean, I remember, I mean, just thinking about Jenga FX and well, one using Odin, I mean, yeah, it, it's sort of interesting. A lot of folks when I talk to them about uh, founders of companies and stuff, that it's, it's yeah. so risky, you know, using a language that's not C or C++ or whatever, yeah. whatever's popular. Uh, but one, what a competitive advantage to, you know, use something that compiles yeah. fast, focuses on performance. Uh, and second, uh, you know, good on them for, you know, being like, hey, why don't we hire Bill, you know? <laughs> yeah, expert, yeah. You know? Well, I think also <laughs> help that I actually knew, knew Morton for help. But <laughs> okay. even then, it was... Uh... Yeah, it's, 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 it is a risk. Of course it's a risk mm -hmm. to use any language that doesn't exist already and not the tool set. But at the same time, what they were doing was a risk. Mm -hmm. Like, you never know if this was going to sell or not. You didn't. You, you're hoping it was. That's what happens when anyone starts a business and people forget. It's like, you hope this is going to work? Like, I've just started another business myself, which is a brewery, mm -hmm. which I, I make <laughs> beer. And I'm hoping, hoping that's going to do well. And if not, oh, well, mm -hmm. that's a risk you've got to take. Um, 
and I think again, it's any with anything you do, like your tool set. If you know that tool set very well, um, use what's best for you. Don't just use what's the most fashionable. Like go like, you know what? We can do what we can do. We can do it with this tool, and I know this tool very well. Let's use that tool. Mm -hmm. And that's what Odin was for Django FX, and it still is to this day. And again, and again, Odin has been shaped by what Django FX is needed to a certain extent as well, because you've got real world experience. It's not just designing it for yourself. Like oh. I wouldn't have even thought about doing this. And I'm like, oh yeah, how do we solve that problem? And then right, find out once we implement the solution, like loads of people go, oh, thank goodness you've solved my problem as well. It's like, oh, okay, it wasn't just us kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, do you, do you, yeah, it was common to think. Do, do you think there is sort of a, a change or a shift in the way things are going where folks are saying, yeah, let's just give ourselves the best chance. Use Odin because that's the right tool for this yeah. problem. And it's a competitive advantage, right? Uh, as you said, you don't know if, you know, whatever product uh, is being released is going to work when you're starting a company. No. So why not just, you know, go all in? <laughs> that to a certain extent, yeah. That's why loads of companies have gone. At the, again, Rust is a very big popular one. People are going all in at Rust uh, for better or for worse. Um, and I don't mean that it's, again, not a criticism as Rust, just more of a for better or for worse, they're risking, like, you know, what, we're going to try this language or this mm -hmm. tool or whatever it is. And, but that's the thing about, like, entrepreneurship in general or anything like that it's, it's risk taking that's mm -hmm. what it is fundamentally you're hoping that your idea is going to work and it's going to be popular for the market and doing it that way mm -hmm. sometimes it isn't sometimes it isn't uh but i mean i don't know it's just very weird to state but it is again it's just so surreal that even odin even is even where it is now mm -hmm. um but i'm glad it is but it's oh yeah yeah, it's very cool. I mean, have you found that writing, you know, in your career as far as writing software, has it been different writing a programming language? Uh, and especially maybe now at the later point where you've yeah. got, you know, companies and open source projects and stuff that rely on you versus, I don't know, developing a, a product or some other tool, I guess. Um, is there sort of a the difference is, that you're finding? I'm sorry, no. It's, mm. it's identical. And I think that's what surprises people. It's like, no, actually, programming a compiler is no different to program programming a game mm. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, the only difference is, is loads of people rel rely on my product. So that means I can't just break it quickly. Mm -hmm. And then like, whoops, sorry, guys, I've broken it. <laughs> Sometimes I may do that. But it's like, no, I I'll say, look, I've broken it, but we needed to because in this thing, we usually give big, massive warning. Like, for instance, Owen's about done with the language. Like, it's, like mm -hmm. I'm just doing the final things at the moment, which are like, yeah, we're done. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we've got to polish it and I'm going to write the specification and like that way. But so clearly once we got to 1.0, official 1.0, uh, that's it. All we have to be backwards compatible from that point on. Mm -hmm. And that's something where that is true in many other pieces of software. Like if you've ever made software for like, I'm just saying in general for people, your customers or your users or whatever they may be, um, rely on it working and they rely, work on it, what they expect. You can't just keep changing it every, every little version you do. Because customers will get really annoyed at you. Mm -hmm. And they will. They'll probably jump ship to go something else. Even if it's not as good, they'll just like, at least this is stable. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that's the thing is, I think people understand that compilers aren't actually more different from any other piece of software. At the end of the day, you're transforming data into the form of data, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is what programming is. It's just how you transform it, which is the magical bit. Yeah, yeah. I guess I got I to gotta sneak in, because I said earlier I'd sneak in the Rob Pike yeah. uh, proverb here. Uh, but he says, data do dominates. If you've chosen the right data structures and organized things well, the algorithms will almost always be self-evident. Data structures, not algorithms, are essential to programming. Uh, so again, data transformation. Yeah, he was paraf <laughs> uh, paraphrasing uh, Fred Brooks at the time as well, okay. where Fred Brooks, Brooks is quote, if I remember it correctly, uh, show, me your, no, show me your flow charts mm -hmm. and conceal your tables and I shall be baffled uh, or something like that, and then show me your tables, um, and I won't need. To, I usually won't need to see your flowcharts because it'd be obvious. Mm -hmm. I think that's not the exact quote, but it's close enough. Yep. Uh, so that's kind of the same thing that Rob Pike is kind of monitoring there, obviously, because mm -hmm. it's the mm -hmm. be clear. Like what you think is like, I don't know, a lot of people think it's like I need to try to get the right algorithm. It's like, look, if you lay out your data correctly, mm -hmm. it'll be obvious what the algorithm should be. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes. Again, people forget this, mm -hmm. but that's what it is. If you lay again, make, if you lay out your database correctly, if you just do a database, it'd be obvious how you meant to do everything with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's hard. Laying it out is hard. It's not saying it's easy. It's just once you've done that, the rest of it falls into place. 
right? Which just always reminds me of the Mike Acton, you know, quote uh, from one of his data-oriented talks about yeah. under make sure you understand the problem, uh, and then you can understand, you know, how to transform the data. Um, yes. Do you have any sort of process or, um, I mean, again, for teaching, sometimes folks will use like a design recipe or a scientific method or something. Do you sort of deeply think about these, um, you know, when you've got something to add to Odin or a piece of code to write, do you sort of deeply think about it? Do you just try to prototype something and get it working and then kind of shape it from there? What's your sort of process look like? All of the above. All the so above. a lot of the time, um, a lot of time my, my problems are getting solved when I'm either walking the dog or having a shower. Mm hmm. I'm not even joking, like, I may be working for eight hours a day, I take a break to walk my dog at lunchtime or something, and I'm like, yep, that's how I solve that problem. Mm -hmm. But if I kept at that desk, I wouldn't have solved it, because the change of environment helped it, just literally changing of what the activity I'm doing, and having kind of like a mindless, not mindless, it's just more of a, my mind is doing something else, mm -hmm. then they, usually the, the solutions come to me. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing when I'm like thinking about when I was, when I was designing Odin and stuff, is that a lot of the time I was like, okay, I'm toying this idea in my head, my mind, just doing it that way. And sometimes I had to prototype to see if it worked, but sometimes I'm like, no, I can prototype it in my mind. So just do it there. And then you have to figure out all of the issues you can go through it and go in every single direction. Like, okay, so how do people actually would conceive about this? How would they deal with this? And go that way. But then sometimes you have to do the other one. Like you have to prototype it, test it out for people. And then they go, oh yeah, I didn't expect them to do this. Ah, okay. oh, yeah, I, I'm like, oh yeah, that's the case. And now it makes sense why people assume this, but this, that's not what I assumed kind of thing. Because you've got to remember is everyone thinks differently, obviously. But then you also have to understand is that, um, how do I put it? People will surprise you as well. Mm -hmm. Like what you think is obvious is not going to be obvious to other people. And what you think is so opaque is going to be like so intuitive. Like we talk about this intuitive. I'm like, what? Um, so it's kind of the, you kind of have to have sometimes a lot, just like a, think a lot about it a lot. And then you solve the problem, which is kind of like the Feynman joke. Like, okay, got problem. Think about it for a lot. Yep, write down solution. <laughs> um, or sometimes it's more of the a bit of experimental bit, which is like, okay, I'll experiment with this idea, see how it goes, get it tested by other people, and if it's bad, uh, eat it. If it's good, polish it. Mm -hmm. um, kind of thing. But that's the thing is, again, there's no general way of doing things. You have to do both sometimes. Yeah, it takes me back to, I remember reading about Alan Turing said he had most of his great ideas mm. as a long distance run and then just go yeah. out in a field and... Uh, that's you know where, where some of the great theories yeah. came from, and this works. Uh, it's very cool. <laughs> oh yeah, again, where did these ideas come from? I don't know. Yeah. But it's not from hard thinking. It's just usually like a revelation and more of a thing than a logical steps of figuring it out. It's never <laughs> that. It's never that. Yeah. Do, are there any features of Odin that have um, sort of been influenced then by? just percolating over time or sort of talking with the community and any that sort of jumped to mind of like, this is really important. And I hadn't thought about this. It's usually little things. Hmm. And it sounds like the little things do add up. Um, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think of one that comes off the top of my head right now, but I'm struggling, but it's, it's sometimes the little things and people don't know. A good, a good example of this was when I did bit sets. Hmm. Um, bit sets in Odin are like, and if you know Pascal, you know what a set is. And in this case, bit sets taken like either a range or a uh, an enum. Usually, most people pass an enum. So this means bit sets. A bit set of an enum is effectively just a flags. These are how you set flags with your enums. Hmm. And then getting that to tweak right. As soon as I got it polished correctly by asking people, how does this feel? Effectively, how does it feel when you get polished? People go, "Yep, that's my favorite feature in the language now." I'm like, "Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> this wait a set?" <laughs> like yeah, yeah, I'm like like okay, but it really is because it's just one of those where you didn't have it in C C or C plus mm plus. -hmm. Many other languages don't have it properly, especially not with the layout that it has, because it is just a an integer backed thing where you can then just treat it as if it's a set, bit literally bit set. Um, but then polishing it to make it feel correct, like with the syntax and the semantics, people go, "Yep, I love it." But it's such a minor thing to me. It's just like. Okay, fine, sure, but it was a, again a lovely surprise. But that's one of the things that just kind of popped to mind was just that. Uh, but other things like ones I was tailoring for was like the constant value system that took years mm. to get polished correctly because mm -hmm. um, you have to, and even then you still have compromises and stuff that people don't like. But you have to figure out um, like how does this work so I don't have to have all the problems I have in C. Now I won't explain what that is here, but it was just more of a constant value system where things are untyped or they haven't got a concrete type yet or they're existential types mm -hmm. if you use the Haskell terminology whatever um, 
But there you go. That's kind of those kind of things. It's just the little things which make the biggest difference. It's not like a giant thing plastered here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, very interesting. Um, so, you know, we kind of talked about Odin uh, 1.0 coming, you know, eventually. I'm not going to ask you a date yes. or anything. No, no, <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the language is a pretty much 1.0. I mm -hmm. just, at the time of recording, I did pretty much the last feature, which was the mm. bit, I didn't nickname was subject change, but the bit fields, which is in C, you could say here's a struct and here's all the sizes, like bit sizes on it. We've kind of done the same thing in Odin. And that was pretty much the, maybe the second to last feature that we ever needed to do. Mm -hmm. um, to say like, yeah, the language is done, right? Can we actually just put a nail in it and say we're actually, f we're officially there now. Mm -hmm. Is that sort of freeing in some sense? Because then you can focus on maybe uh, ecosystem or packages and I mean just getting at a really I, nice this will laugh I, uh, I don't actually like writing compilers mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be working on a compiler forever I like writing in the language itself mm -hmm. and um, be nice just to say yep this is done okay we're in not maintenance mode but I don't have to start thinking like a designer as much anymore mm -hmm. kind of thing mm -hmm. um, which is not nice. language design is a different discipline to many other things it really is it's not the same, right? Writing a compiler and designing a language are complete different disciplines. Like the overlap is very little. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those where I'm like, I'd, I'd rather work in Odin, write the libraries, maybe write the libraries, or just write code. Just mm. write code using Odin. So kind of, yeah, it would be really. Can kind of ask because you know you're you're deep. You know, writing a compiler or a language mm. like Odin, you learn all these different things. I'm sure, like type theory mm. and you know different aspects of compilation yes. were these things that i mean how did you sort of pick up these topics was this just again uh you know reading some good books or did you just go head in and start building and learn as you go well i've, I've built compilers before i know it's not my okay. first um just put that bluntly like i've done little languages before so i knew enough about languages and how they worked and the compilers and they worked but then when it comes to type theory just pick it up as you go along kind mm -hmm. of thing i've never really had to like, oh, I've read a book on it. Here's how we go. I'm like, yeah, I usually pick up topics. This is how I learn most things in general. I kind of, I, as I joke, a Monte Carlo simulated learning, um, but it works <laughs> for me. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of tie the threads in like, oh, there's a gap here. I'm like, okay, how do I fill in this gap with my knowledge? And then try and go in. And then you find out it goes, everything's practically goes down forever. There's no bottom to what you know. And um, so that's kind of the way I kind of do stuff. So if you hear, I was, I was just saying like existential types earlier for the constant value system. It's like, well, yeah, I, I do know um, how those things work and stuff. Like I do actually try and know that actual like other languages. I need to know how other languages work as well. Mm -hmm. It isn't just, um, what's it called? Uh, just knowing like, oh, I know C languages very well. I don't see family. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, I need to know the ML family. I need to have list family. I need to know the fourth family. I'm like, if you don't know the alternatives, how do you know this is a good way of doing things? Mm -hmm. Like if you don't have anything to compare it to. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, it's certainly impressive the the wealth of knowledge you have about programming languages. <laughs> well, you kind of have to. You kind of have yeah, to. You, 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 if you were doing it, you'd learn it kind of thing. It's not, <laughs> it's not that impressive once you realize it. it's like, yeah, you're going to have to learn this. Yeah. But it certainly requires the, the time and dedication. And as you said, you know, yeah. having prior experience working in those languages, knowing what the pain points are, which... Yeah. Um, again, might be obvious, you know, folks know some of the, a lot of the foot guns, as they say in C, but you learn mm. to live with them. And uh, so how do you design well, you do, them and the, the people forget that they're even problems because you cope. You literally, mm -hmm. it comes like to a certain thing, Stop, Stockholm syndrome. Mm -hmm. Like, of course it's good. I need point arithmetic. I really need point arithmetic. I'm like, show me your code. I'm like, yeah, here's how I'd write it. It's a slice mm -hmm. with slices or something usually. I'm like, and they go, oh, I never thought I needed it. I'm like, you don't most you don't really need like explicit point arithmetic most of the time. Mm -hmm. Like there are sometimes you actually do if you're doing something really low level. But most of the time, like there's better constructs out there. But that's the thing is if you only know one way of thinking, mm -hmm. you don't know the alternatives. Like mm -hmm. and that's the thing is you can't actually judge yourself very well. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, this is kind of an interesting transition point as we're nearing sort of the end. Um, yeah. And I feel like this whole conversation has been chock full of advice and wisdom. <laughs> so I don't even I know that. I'm so sorry if it isn't. If any, yeah. yeah. Thank you anyway. Uh, um, but I don't know how to ask, like, you know, maybe there's a, a book or an article or a video. And, and again, maybe I'm aiming this towards 
students or just some aspiring no, no, programmers? Of course. Um, you know, where do you kind of point them? I mean, obviously they can try out Odin, but um, no. Well, the yeah. one thing I always recommend to kind of like beginners ish, um, mm -hmm. I always recommend is um, effectively algorithms plus data structures equals programs by uh, Niklaus Viet, Nicholas mm -hmm. Worth, what do you want to call his name, mm -hmm. the creator of the Pascal language. I've always very much liked his uh, work because he's he's a teacher. He, well, he was a teacher, um, and how he his style of teaching, his design his style of designing even languages and such has been a massive, massive influence on me. Mm -hmm. And I would highly recommend that that book is not in publication anymore. It's from the seventies, mm -hmm. um, but if you, you can easily find the PDF on like on his website and stuff, um, and I'd, I'd recommend just reading through that because mm -hmm. it would be simple, clear, and to the point. It may not be the most advanced stuff. It is very basic stuff. Again, it's learning about basic data structures, basic algorithms. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that book, you'll also learn how to make the compiler mm -hmm. to the language that was written in it. Mm -hmm. Literally, it, the language that you, it's written in is you will get the compiler at the end, how to learn how to do it. Yeah. Kind you, of thing, which is kind of like minor thing, but it's not. It's like you're now knowing what the data structures are you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a pretty. I think they write the compiler and it compiles to P code or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah, that one. It would. It, it, in the book itself, it doesn't go to P code, but okay. it, the. Uh, I think it just does the front end actually in the book itself, mm -hmm. which is fine because uh, this. I don't want to go too much of a tangent. I know you need to finish, but short answer <laughs> go it is. Go for it. Go for it. Uh, in, in the day, early day, most people knew assembly, so it was obvious how to lower down assembly. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, most people don't know anything about assembly, so it's kind of like, oh, how do I lower down this to assembly? That is the mystery to them, mm -hmm. even though back in the day it was so obvious. Mm -hmm. Nowadays it's like, oh, how do I do this? So it's unfortunate. I, there's not many books that I know that I've read personally that I would recommend that do that step. But I'm not trying to say you should write a compiler. You shouldn't. Most people shouldn't because it's not. You don't need it. Mm -hmm. But it's lovely to know how to do things, even if you don't need those skills again. Yeah, very cool. I mean, this is one of the things you touched on it. Um knowing how some of the low level things work uh, yeah i mean can you speak to just the important i mean this is again for folks yeah. uh, part of the handmade community for instance does an excellent job of you know how do things work building things mm. and being curious about uh tinkering as i was using earlier but more just yeah you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, could, could you sort of maybe even speak to that and maybe the importance of just uh i mean if it is important to you uh which i think it is uh, knowing how well, things work or what what where does that sort of fall into place my general philosophy in like all domains of life is at least know the level below that you are working at mm -hmm. whatever that level below is because if you don't know that level below one you can't access it you don't even need to know to go there because if you actually hit a problem which is at that level you're screwed mm -hmm. and that level below could be i could even take baking for example right let's say you're baking some bread right you're following the recipe you know how to follow the recipe that's great it's like, great, do you know why you have to do, like, I don't know, let it rest, do the kneading, let the proof stages. Do you understand why those things are needed? And if not, you just follow the recipe, I'm like, yeah, go learn that. Like, learn the techniques of different types of kneading techniques or something like that, or uh, different, like, auto lease, or you're doing, like, hey, you may even be a no-need approach, but, like, you learn that why those things work mm -hmm. and why that, that's another level, and then that's just, you need, then you know, but like, the daily level is like, I know how to make bread. I'll just make bread. That's not, you don't have to know why those things are, but when something's gone wrong or you want to look, actually improve it, it's better to know the level below. And by the way, there's a level below that as well. It doesn't stop until you hit that like, quantum field theory, right, pretty much, um, or philosophy or mathematics. Like there's, there's always a, but even then it's like, there's probably a level below that probably. <laughs> it's just, we don't know it yet. Um, and that's the point. It's, it's always useful to know just one level below whatever you're doing. It, it doesn't have to be in program. It could be in any area of your life. Because at least then you have the skills to go there if necessary. Yeah, brilliant. I think that's that's brilliant advice. Yeah. And um, yeah, I don't know how to how to top it, but maybe that's a good point to sort of uh, wrap things up. And yeah. um, I, I mean, I want to shout out uh, on your behalf, uh, and then I'll give you a chance to to give the closing words yeah. or shout out anything. But uh, you've got your website at uh, gingerbill.org, uh, the Odin yes. Lang uh, website. Folks can Google again. Yeah. I'll, I'll link that as well as the. Uh, hello, uh, whatever uh, site. That is, that is, that's the Odin <laughs> website as well. That is the Odin yeah. website, but yeah. Um, and then yeah. Uh, you've got a YouTube channel as well where you do a bunch of great yes. content and stuff on Odin. Yeah. So, you know, folks should definitely check that out to, to hear from, you know, the creator uh, himself. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> so uh, anything, any final words, anything you want to shout out here at the end? 
firstly, just thank you very much for having me on, Mike. Anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Um, and again, just again, people check out Odin, check out all our products at Django Effects as well, uh, especially if you're an artist. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's been fun. It's been really fun.